Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Dix uh, of the uh, SIPSI Society Light and Lighting Home Counties Northwest uh, Committee, the uh, regional representative. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today Mark Southern Bain of Southern Bain Associates. Mark will be talking to you today about his practices lighting design for Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford. Some of you may have joined an earlier presentation on this project I gave back in November as part of a case study for Geraldine O'Farrell's uh, talk of, on uh, historic buildings and lighting, uh, Geraldine being from historic England. Um, following this, there was a lot of interest in hearing more about the actual lighting design for the scheme uh, for which Mark um, was uh, responsible. And I'm very pleased uh, Mark has agreed to join us to do this. I'll hand over to Mark in just a moment. Uh, before that, a couple of housekeeping notes. Should you have any issues during the uh, call, we recommend you disconnect and reconnect. Um, and this event is being recorded by uh, Brendan. So following the presentation, the recording will be made available on the SIPSI website, but it may take a few days for it to go up. Uh, that's it from me. So I'm pleased to hand over now to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to talk about the project of lighting the cathedral in Christchurch College, Oxford. Uh, it is it is an unusual project because it is a cathedral that is the chapel of a college. So Christchurch uh, College, Oxford has the famous Tom Tower uh, entrance, which is a dominating feature in that part of Oxford, designed by Sir Christopher Wren, and it leads through into uh, the biggest quad in Oxford called Tom Quad, um, and it, which, which is a, a fantastic large space, very grand indeed. Leading off that quad are a number of spaces, and one of which is the famous uh, stairs that lead up to the hall, and this staircase featured uh, largely in the uh, Harry Potter films um, and the staircase leads up to the uh, Great Hall which was the inspiration for the Hall of Hogwarts so as a result there are huge numbers of tourists and uh, Harry Potter fans visiting this college on a regular basis. The cathedral is approached through two surprisingly humble doors um, and uh, off, off Tom Quad, and uh, you go through these two small, two small openings, there's a lantern, and then that leads you into the cathedral itself. The cathedral is one of the smallest cathedrals in the UK, but it is wonderfully exciting. It has a range of architectural styles ranging from Norman up to Victorian and it's a very complicated series of spaces and lots of the spaces join one another um, lots of them can be seen from one to another and the photo on the right shows shows the lighting how it was before we started the project um, with a, a big range of um, of different brightnesses uh, uh, which which didn't really follow the kind of structure of the spaces. But the the spaces are really complicated and it took a long time to get our mind around the complexity of the spaces and to work out how they were related to each other uh, and, uh, and how we could um, define the different spaces and yet allow interaction between them when necessary. And there were a few absolutely charming lighting features that were there already. I wish we had designed this one. It's so simple and so dramatic um, and it, it ticks all the boxes. It, it's a it's a clamp on metal structure that uh, has no no attachment or, or drilling into the lovely historic column so it can be removed whenever we wanted. And it's just a ring of candles all around, all around that that column, um, and it looks great when it's lit as well. Um, so, so you know, we, we we inherited not a blank canvas, but we inherited a project where there was quite a lot of of quite interesting work that had gone before. 
So the original electric lighting scheme that was there when we started the project was tungsten. Now, at high level in the cathedral, there's a walkway and you can walk around most of the cathedral at high level. But whoa, it is high. Uh, you can only go up there if you are harness trained and you're wearing a full harness because um, you don't want to fall off that walkway, um, you know, and, and, and it's a long way down. But here you can get some idea of the of the tungsten installation. You can see rows of 50 watt uh, AR111 lamps. Do, are all doing a good job. Um, it, the design was, was skillfully done, but it just had come to the end of, of its life. Um, and so th it was all interesting to see that. A bit lower in the cathedral, um, there were a number of boxes that, that had been made. Um, um, and these contained these contained 50 watt um, tungsten halogen lamps, um, dichroics, uh, and, and they'd gone to a lot of trouble and, and, and effort, um, uh, you know, in order to to hide these as, as much as possible. Um, and you can see they, they they painted the color of the box really carefully to 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 link to to merge into the stonework that was surrounding. And they'd also uh, linked in, they'd also painted the color of the transformer to fix in, again, to, fix, to, to, to match in with the stone and the electrical junction boxes. And the lighting did work quite well. I mean, that, that box lit up that bit of architecture really quite nicely. Um, and uh, it did quite a good job, but it was elderly technology. Um, and it was, you know, all the classic problems of, of, of a tungsten scheme, very high energy costs and great problems getting spares uh, and all that kind of thing. Lower down in the cathedral, there are lots of lights for lighting the stalls and lighting the choir seats and all that kind of thing. And when we started working our way through them, there was a huge range of light sources in them. They had tried quite rightly to uh, install uh, LEDs um, and there's an, a rather charming early LED installation. Uh, made a bit of glare, as you can see in the middle photo, but it was a good attempt. And, uh, and, and so we had a big challenge trying to integrate all these different light sources, which of course we couldn't change the fittings that, that held these light sources. Um, we couldn't change the look of anything at all because the building is extremely important um, and of course, of course, listed. And so we had to make sure that any updates we did to the light sources did not change the, the look of these fittings at all. And when we started analyzing the fittings, we came across a fantastic range of light sources. Um, some even used car technology. Um, the, the lamp on the left is, is, is uh, a 21 watt uh, lamp that used used in cars and and of course it's it's convenient because it's small and uh and low voltage so therefore safe but but they do uh, uh, tungsten lamps that were designed for cars do have very short lives some some standard bayonet and then on the right that's actually a photograph of, of the scheme after there 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 were g4 uh, lamp holders and we replaced those with uh LED retrofits. Going back to the higher level, the existing lighting was quite glary and th there was a lot of electrical infrastructure which was visible. Um, and so we one of one of the one of the targets we set ourselves was to reduce glare and to reduce the visibility of electrical infrastructure and to reduce the visibility of lighting equipment and to let the wonderful architecture sing and to let the lighting do what it has to do in order to make the functioning of the cathedral efficient and good and attractive and without people being discouraged uh, and, and seeing uh, electrical infrastructure. So the project started and um, the, the team was architects Purcell, 
The electrical engineer was C CBG Consultants, led by Chris Dix, who spoke at the beginning of this presentation and who kindly set this event up. And there was a lot of work to do on the fabric of the cathedral. Um, and this work had to be integrated in with all the lighting work. And it was decided right at the beginning that the lighting work would be staged because it was very important to keep the cathedral operating and working and open to the public and open for services right through the entire project. And that meant a huge amount of planning had to happen. It meant, for example, here's the project just starting. Here's the scaffolding in place for one of one of the bays. But as you can see, there's temporary lighting underneath. Um, it's, it's quite bright, but it doesn't matter. It's temporary lighting. But that temporary lighting had to provide safe access for members of the public who could get un go underneath there. And of course, emergency lighting had to be provided. Um, and so, so this was a, a really complicated phasing um, program that had to be created right at the beginning to make sure that this requirement from the client could be carried out. So fabric work started and lighting design and implementation started. And one of the one of the things that we do on on big projects at Sutton Vane Associates is we like to give a demonstration of the lighting to the client body. Um, and this is a very useful thing to do because lighting is trickery, tricky stuff. I mean, I can say, hey, it's going to be a bright, crisp light over there and a dimmer, warmer light here. And I've got a, a picture in my mind of what it looks like. But the client team may have a completely different idea in their minds of what that looks like. And what you don't want is come switch on day, the client to say, oh, that's not what we thought we were going to get. So by doing a demonstration, you can show them um, what they are going to get. And in the demonstration, we, we set up samples of the exact fittings, the luminaires that we're going to be using um, in, in in typical examples of the places. And we can then show it. We can show the client roughly what they're going to get and, of course, photograph it very carefully. And then the client, first of all, can see what they're going to get and can make comments. They can say, oh, we don't like that or yes, we love that. And while doing the demonstration, everybody learns a huge amount um, and and it's a really good exercise. So we set the demonstration up and here it is being set up there. We got the lighting on the up lighting of that aisle is too bright, um, but it's it's often hard to get fully dimmable fittings during a demonstration. Um, and so 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 therefore the lighting is was too bright, but we were able to explain that to the client. Um, and, and, and there you, there, there's a close up of the lighting that does that up lighting. Um, we had to do prob probably more up lighting than I would have liked in this project because there were large areas of the cathedral where it was impossible to light um, areas with any other way. Um, unless we had very obvious light fittings um, uh, that were kind of added on and became visible and we just didn't want to do that. Um, also, there was the aesthetic that a lot of uplighting had been used in the previous scheme and everybody was comfortable with that. So it made sense to kind of to carry on. We um, used the demonstration to check how the lighting was performing. And uh, on the left is the, the, the light meter reading, 10.2 lux um, before we turned on our proposed lights. And yes, the existing scheme was very dark. Um, and uh, uh, and that, that is typical of the kind of levels that, 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 that were around. Um, and, uh, and there, 172 lux with the with the uh, proposed lighting. That's probably a bit higher 
than, than, than we got everywhere. But it just show, gives an idea of the kind of scale um, of, of the lighting of the lighting that we got. Um, and uh, and so so we were certainly s satisfying one of the requirements, which was to get lighting that, that could really give everybody um, good lighting to read their song sheets, read their music or whatever was required. Also in the demonstration, we showed updating the lights on places like choir stalls and, and places like that. Um, and so the left is the existing, the right is the proposed. Um, so we walked the client team around, we showed them the lights, um, and there you can see uh, a, a bit of a bit of, a bit of dimming on that uplighting of the arches, um, and you can see that the client team, and there were large numbers of them. And anyway, we got generally got approval, and the whole thing went to, went ahead. So then we started detailed design, and and uh, bit by bit working through details of different areas and moving into the details of the whole thing. So one of the tricky things that we have to have to do in a project like this is is to make sure the lighting is as hidden as possible, but is also delivering the lighting that is needed to the places um, where it's needed, but, but but by being as hidden as possible. And there were lots of places in the cathedral we simply couldn't get to easily, and so we have a system where, by, where we use um, lasers and that kind of thing, um, and we use those to, 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 to create lines of sight. And so with two people working with a laser, one person can aim the laser and, and put a point where the light fitting might be starting to show above, for example, that capital on that column on the left. And then the other person can walk around the cathedral and say, mm, I can see that dot of light, um, so I think we need to go a bit lower there or we need to move it a bit. And there on the right, someone's up high, up on that very high level walkway. You can just about see the spot of the laser light on, on the floor way down below. Uh, of again, how we're checking, there's someone down there checking that if there was going to be a spotlight where the laser is being held, how far in can it light, uh, you know, um, before it starts becoming too visible and how well can it be hidden behind that column and that kind of thing. We designed the controls um, system for the whole cathedral and we were quite daring with that. We, we decided it would make sense to use um, a, 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 a new technology. So we went for a wireless system, the Bluetooth LE, and um, we had to do quite a lot of tests to make sure that the, 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 the signals could get through uh, the large volumes of uh, thick walls and, and, and large amounts of stone that there are in the whole cathedral. Um, and here you can see the typical uh, box with the, with the uh, Bluetooth um, receivers. Um, and these were these were uh, put all around the cathedral to power the lights. And then we had relay nodes in various locations, all of course hidden away, and we had to work out where those were going to go. And so that's a, a typical early early design um, feature, just showing where we're going to hide them out of sight there, but in a place where there's good radio reception, so the relay can easily pick up and retransmit the wireless signals. Simultaneously, we started working on ways of fixing the lights. Um, and so, so the left hand sketch is a very early sketch, um, just showing the ways that, that, that high level spotlights could be clamped onto columns. No new holes allowed anywhere in the cathedral. So if we needed to fix onto something that doesn't have any, any way of fixing, it had to be clamped on. And all these the, these clamps had um, neoprene on the inside, so they wouldn't mark the stone at all. So if they need to be removed in 20 or 50 years time, it can all be it's all removable um, and can all be taken away and leave no trace on 
the, the fabric of the cathedral. So there you can see on the left the early sketch and then the first prototypes experimenting with um, uh, the, the, the beacons from Concord um, on, on, on our temporary rig on a capital to make sure it does work. And there the first renders from uh, the manufacturers of showing how groups of these fittings could all be grouped together so they could be easily installed and so they all hold together. We carried out detailed surveys um, of the of the entire fabric at high level um, because we had to know where things could be fixed and of course where things could be hidden. So so on the left is, is a photograph of just one location um, up there on the walkway. In the middle is a quick, a quick sketch showing where the, the four fittings could go and below in, 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 in the pinky colour is where the stabilisation for, the, for, for that structure would be uh, and how it would be held down. And you can see there we found an existing bit of a threaded rod sticking out of the existing structure, so that was fantastic. So we could fix onto that and make, make the whole thing safe. So an awful lot of work was done that way um, to, to make sure uh, that we were not in any way interfering with this fantastic historic structure. The lighting was installed using a, a mixture of, of methods. Um, some very tall towers were used for some, some parts um, and uh, other parts uh, were, were more scaffolded um, and, and so that made life easier for the contractors. Um, but, but parts where, where we could, some parts of the cathedral were roped off from public access, but always leaving enough to make sure the cathedral could carry on working. And so year by year, the project proceeded and outside in Tom's quad, the seasons came and the seasons went, but slowly the work um, got towards completion. And it was a wonderful moment when we started to see working lights there in the cathedral. And here's one little detail. Um, we had to provide bright light for people, three people sit underneath this, this absolutely fantastic metal grill. And they previously just could not read their music. So we designed a way of concealing tiny little black lights in up amongst that metal work. And in the middle picture that I, I took that just after they've been installed. So the wires haven't yet been tidied away, but you're beginning to get some idea of how, how well those lights disappeared. And when you move away from that screen and get the kind of view that the public sees, uh, th then, then, then you start to see that actually those spots really have disappeared. Um, and in fact, hey, you can't see them. Um, they are there. Uh, and uh, even when you zoom in, you can hardly see them. And there they are, circled in those white circles. And uh, it gives some idea of where they are hidden away. And uh, most people have only two spotlights, but the most important person sits on the right. So he or she gets three spotlights, lucky person. But that's the kind of way we designed all the details in this incredibly complex space. One of the features of the cathedral is this huge range of styles of architecture. And they often crash into each other. So quite often we have a column where one side is one style of architecture and the other side is another style. And this made uh, integrating and hiding lighting extremely difficult. We had to carry out a survey of every single column in the whole cathedral to work out where we could put fittings, what kind of fitting, how wiring could be got to that. Um, because even though the lights were receiving uh, Bluetooth radio control signals, um, 
they had to have power. Um, and so uh, uh, wires were still are still needed. Um, and, and there are also wonderful parts of the cathedral where, where the architecture just just stops, as you can see on that right hand picture. And the top, top of the columns just never got finished, and then something else happened. And uh, and, uh, and and I love I love that evidence of the, of the the way the building developed over the years. So light started to appear at the top of columns, and this is one of the ways in which we uh, concealed up lights at the top of columns. This is a linear light that wraps around the top um, of, of a capital. The lighting is a quite narrow uh, beam uh, linear light, so it aims its peak right up to the top of the vaulting. Um, and it is, of course, dimmable. All lights in the whole cathedral are dimmable so that the lighting can be set for all the various different kinds of performances um, and services and events that happen in this cathedral. Um, the, there's a small upstand that, we, that, that was added onto the tops of these capitals, and this is a, a view looking down into that top of that capital on, on the left. And there you can see, you can see it's a, it's a wooden upstand. You can see when this photo was taken, it was still wasn't completely finalized. You can see the nails sticking out of the corner still hasn't been knocked in, but that's to leave it all as loose as possible until the last minute when everything is finally signed off. So the, the, the wood was then painted to match the color of the stone. Um, and, and those fittings, as a result of all those tests we did with laser pointers some while before, we knew exactly how high to put those fittings so they could get the maximum amount of light out to light up each vault from each capital um, without being seen from down below. Um, then, th so this is one, one way of lighting the tops of the capitals. Oh, and in that slide on the left, you can see the still new um, uh, MICC uh, cable. They're just running down in the corner of that capital. So that will age and the copper will come a little bit more tarnished and a bit darker and duller. Um, and, and the architects and everybody love the way that, that, that copper ages. It's very natural um, and it's very traditional for buildings like this. And it really does disappear. Um, as you can see in the right hand photo, you just simply can't see it, even though it is there running up the, the, the right the right hand arch. So the other way of uplighting, when we had totally different styles of capitals, was to use a clutch of tiny little spotlights. And this photo is taken from high level. Uh, it was up scaffolding. Um, because that's the only way you can see the little spotlights. So to show to show to show how we achieve this effect, um, the fo the, this photo is taken from high up. But when you're down on the ground, um, you don't see the spotlights. But they pick up the rhythm of the, all the lines of architecture up there, um, and enabled us to really emphasize the, 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 those lines, um, and to be able to have a flexible approach. I, I love soft approaches that can be altered to suit um, the architecture. Um, and so we could choose the right number of spots for every single, it wasn't even for every single uh, column, it was for every single side of every single column because they all varied so much. Um, and so, so by using this kind of technique, it was possible to say, right, we're going to have three spots on this side of this part of this column and four spots over here and two over there and that kind of thing. And that's how you can then really get the lighting to um, show off the particular architecture of that particular part of the cathedral. You can also see just on the, on, on the towards the right of that picture, some downlights. Um, and 
bearing in mind this is taken from a view that the public can't see, uh, but they are pretty well hidden uh, and they are providing the functional lighting needed down below um, in order to get the, the right amount of light for people to, to, to read their music or their hymn sheets or whatever down below. In other parts of the cathedral, um, we uh, hid lights uh, behind uh, wooden structures. Here there's, there's another linear hidden behind a wooden upstand, the base of, of, of a whole row of windows. Um, and here they're, they're doing a good job of lighting uh, the vaulting above. And below you can see the, the row of, um, of, of sort of like, almost like table lights uh, on the choir stalls, um, which are now fitted with the new brighter and of course fully dimmable lamps um, without changing the look of the fitting in any way at all but those are now leds um, and uh, and they're all they're all dimmable um, there was an interesting thing here because 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 the uh these ones i think it was these ones if not it was it was other ones that look very similar had the g4 lamp holders and we had to replace them with dimmable g4 retrofits so they, of course, were designed to work on uh, dimmed 12 volts AC. And so we had quite a lot of challenges to find a dimmable transformer these days that would both work with the G4 LED retrofit and work with the control system. Um, and uh, funnily enough, the, the solution was to use uh, a, a, an old fashioned wire wound transformer, a dimmable wire wound transformer, because that was was the one kind of transformer that could both work with the output of the control system and which the G4 lamps were happy with receiving as a dimmed 12 volt input. Moving around the cathedral, we um, picked out quite a few um, of the important parts of the cathedral that tell the story of the whole building. So we highlighted a very important mem uh, 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 monument, uh, uh, one space, just with the subtle soft edged spotlighting to pick the, uh, the monument out and to make it stand out a bit from, from the background. Nothing dramatic, because that wouldn't be right for the aesthetics of, of this kind of place. Um, and we're now getting to the stage where the whole scheme is beginning to be finished and, and is working together. So here's an early shot of the first, first views of the completed lighting scheme. This is before the balancing was carried out properly. But here you can see some of the elements that that we, sh we showed in the demonstration. There's the lighting of the architecture just below the big round uh, Norman arches. Too bright in here, but uh, there it's showing how it works, how it shows it off. And the lighting on the stonework at the end there is showing off that, that lovely architecture at the end. Again, too bright and not quite centered. And the ceiling is, is is nicely highlighted. You can see the wonderful woodwork up there and plenty of light down below so that those musicians who are about to give a concert can see their music. Um, and this is a performance, so the audience can see them performing as well. So this is this is both architectural lighting and performance lighting working together. And when it was all finally balanced, um, which, which took a long time, many, many visits um, um, responding to different people in the cathedral um, who had different requirements, whether they be clergy or whether they be on the musical side, you know, they, they all wanted a specific kind of lighting for, what, for their activities. And so we had to um, respond to those. And then there were some little details where we integrated lighting just to pick out um, features where there's no place where we could hide the lights at all. Um, there's one 
little altar that is quite important in the way the cathedral is run. Um, and this photo was taken during the day when there's quite a lot of daylight around coming in through the windows. Um, but it was very important for the clergy um, that they could clearly read um, uh, books that are laid on that table. Uh, there isn't one there at the moment, uh, but they had traditionally always had problems reading their text on there. So we hid tiny little lights in this uh, pendant that hangs above the table. Um, and there's a little ring of them there. You can just see the little tiny light. There it is there, just below one of the candles. Um, and this pendant is a candle pendant for real candles. And so we had to run electricity down to it for the first time. Only low voltage, because the drivers are, uh, are a long way away, hidden away. Uh, and that provided low voltage uh, down to this row of tiny little fittings that then just lift the light on that altar and uh, uh, and give enough light for, for the celebrant to see. As a matter of principle, all the drivers um, for all the lighting in the cathedral are all often surprisingly far away from the light fittings because they're all in places where they can be accessed easily. With LED lighting, the thing that's most likely to fail is the electronics in the driver. So uh, if they can be easily accessible, then uh, it, if something should go wrong in the future, um, there's a pretty good chance that it will be the, the drivers. And so at least they can be accessed easily and, and, and the driver can be fixed. And if it's not the driver, at least you have easily discovered where the problem is. Of course, being a place of worship, um, the lighting of the altars was very important. The altars have a lot of gold and a lot of fantastic fabrics. And they uh, uh, need to be made to look valuable and wonderful and to be the highlights and the main points of this cathedral. So they were all lit. Um, and here again, even though there's a surprising amount of daylight in this photo, it is just glowing. It is brighter than it would have been without any spotlighting. Um, and so should there be a, a, a service happening, then it looks really good um, and, and it attracts the eye and people look at it. Similarly, the same principle is used on, on the main altar, which also has a huge amount of gold um, and uh, stands out because it's got subtle spotlighting on it, uh, soft edged from high level, from very high level, from up there on those walkways, but it just picks the altar out. It makes it look just that much more important than the whole of the rest of the cathedral, because that is really what this part of the of the cathedral is about. Um, and so this then then leads to the mo one of the most important views of the cathedral, which is when people first arrive. So you arrive through those two um, uh, quite small humble doors and then you come into the cathedral. And the first thing you see when you first come into the cathedral is this view through this quite dark um, space under the organ. And then there, right in the distance, is this golden altar glimmering and glowing in the distance. And that is the real attractor to the view and to the welcome of the cathedral. And that's what's telling the whole story about the cathedral and is the kind of thing that the lighting should be doing to, to welcome people into the cathedral um, and to draw them in and just to remind them what, what the point is. Um, and, that, and, that, and that here is, is the altar um, right at the end of that fantastic view. So that is the story 
of the lighting of um, Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for a very um, interesting uh, presentation. Um, we've had one or two things come through on the uh, chat so far. Um, do uh, keep posting um, questions and I will uh, put these to Mark. So uh, we just had a question about colour temperature, which um, I, I should say, uh, Edward Sutton Vane, your um, uh, colleague uh, has been uh, answering uh, some of these as well, but uh, I don't know if you just want to say a little bit more about that, Mark, um, kind of which colour temperatures were used in, in which areas and uh, why? Yes, with pleasure. Um, we use 3000 degrees K um, throughout um, because um, while there might have been a temptation to use different colour temperatures in different spaces, because the cathedral is quite open and you can see most spaces from other spaces, it would have been strange to have a view um, at night, this is, um, when, when you saw different parts of the same building in different colour temperature. Um, of course, the 3000K looks quite warm um, uh, when you have lots of daylight coming in, but people expect that, uh, and that, that, that's, a, that's a normal thing. Um, it also meant it carried on the tradition of warm artificial lighting from the previous tungsten scheme that everybody was quite happy with. So, so hence the reason for that choice. Um, and then a, a question from also from uh, Claire uh, Tamara, who has um, noted that the 170 lux, although obviously a lot brighter than the 10 lux you had before, um, still might be considered quite low for reading if you were to sort of compare it with, uh, say, a um, SLL office uh, lighting guide of sort of 300 to 500 lux. Uh, how, how would you sort of strike that balance? Uh, um, uh, th they're quite right that, that that is lower than typical figures for, for office lighting. Um, uh, but but uh, the, the kind of the kind of number that we we delivered uh, is the sort of number that that is um, in the SLL guides for places of worship uh, because it's it's known that 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 they don't want to quite rightly use too much lighting in places of worship because there is of course a cost um, and an energy cost um, and that. Quite often, you just don't need that that level of lighting. It's a, it's only it's only rarely that people are having to read very small type, um, and so th this kind of level is an acceptable kind of level for this kind of place, um, and it, it is a huge increase in what was there, um, and and everybody seems happy with it. Um, the cathedral certainly um, voiced no concerns about those levels at all. I suppose the instances you showed us where you uh, provided specific task lighting, like over the choir stalls and the uh, altar in the side chapel, is is an answer as well, isn't it? If if, if you've got particular uh, areas where people really need to read for long periods. Yes, exactly. Um, and it it is those people who are uh, are are both as choristers in the choir stalls, having to read music, and also quite a lot of those low level lights. Um, are on areas where the public goes, the congregation goes, um, and so they have the benefit of that, that lighting, that low level lighting that certainly uh, ups the lux levels on the on the reading surface um, quite a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, th those photographs um, on the chairs were in a kind of open space um, mm. where I suspect people very rarely uh, are, are trying to uh, detail reading. Um, a good technical question here from uh, Ian McRae. Um, when designing, do you use illuminance, luminance, contrast ratios, or a combination? Um, we do uh, use uh, contrast ratios, um, but uh, um, when when doing this kind of project, what counts at the end of the day is what people see. Um, and so what one can get on a computer, while it's, it's very interesting and it's very useful in the design stage, what counts at the end of the day is actually 
whether things look right and whether people are comfortable in it. Um, it it's all about it's all about the human eye and whether the congregation is happy and whether the performers are happy. Um, and, and, and surprisingly often um, one can get quite different reactions from the people who are using the space to, to what you expected uh, and both ways both you know they can sometimes say they want it a bit brighter please um, and sometimes we we've we've done projects similar projects to this where they actually the client has said it's too bright we want it dimmer please um, and and that's all quite acceptable um, it's you know, as long as one one doesn't start becoming dim on places where there are for example steps or something like that as long as it's all within safe kind of areas um, and it is it, it is a building where people are going to appreciate the historic nature of it um, and part of the historic nature is the atmosphere of the lighting um, and so so it, it's very much the heart and the eyes leading the lighting design in this kind of a project um, in the background beforehand um, just to make sure that we can achieve um, the kind of levels that are um, quoted in the SLR guides and that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that so that that is there as as a safety net in the background. Uh, I, I was going to ask actually, Mark. Um, I mean, given all the different things one could light in a cathedral like this, um, all sorts of niches and statues and monuments and arches were, were there was there anything that sort of um stands out in your memory of something where you decided actually not to light it thing where you sort of thought you know perhaps it didn't need lighting uh yes um and that's a that's a very good point because in buildings like this you there are usually huge numbers of monuments and sculptures and and uh, all kinds of, of, of bits of interesting architecture and there's a tremendous temptation um to light them um you know, you know maybe spotlight them or even just just emphasize them very slightly and the great problem is where do you start and where do you stop um of course in theory you could you could light every single one but if you if you try and spotlight every single one then <laughs> That then they're not standing out anymore because they're all lit to a higher light level and you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot if you try and do them all um, or you could decide not to do any um, and that that sort of makes life easier but in this project as in many projects like like this we spent quite a long time talking with the client team and the architects to work out what were the relatively small number of statues and monuments that that stood out and that were important to the cathedral and that told the story of the cathedral or that somehow emphasized a particular space in in the cathedral and that's why the slide that I showed with one particular monument being lit um, that's near the entrance and, and that starts to tell the story um, to visitors of, of what's coming and so, so it was felt that was a good one to light so you've got to decide um are you going to light them all are you going to light none maybe there's a whole batch of them and you give a, a wash of light light over a whole wall area to give them all a bit of a lift but you've got to be careful not to overdo it um and so so that's very much part of the detailed design that goes into into projects like this the, 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 that you don't overdo it and that you listen to the clients the clients wishes um there's a couple more people sort of uh, asking questions about uh, light levels and uh, things which i think you've addressed um so i'll uh, move on but a, a question here from um, roberto Sierra about uh, the, the issue of glare when uh, lighting the altars and whether that um uh, was something you had to uh, think about or overcome? Uh, absolutely. Um, and and there's, there's, there's two kinds of, of glare when you're doing something like lighting an altar. Um, first of all, you've got to prevent any glare um, to uh, you know, the worshippers and the visitors um, and people coming to, 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 to listen to concerts and that kind of thing. 
Um, so you've got to be very careful how you control the lighting um, of the, the, the altar and the whole space around it. Um, and so we make huge use of using larger numbers of narrower beam fittings um, and hardly any wide beam fittings at all. And then with large numbers of narrow beam fittings, you can um, make um, light small areas individually um, and you can sort of make a chain of little uh, small areas that are lit one by one. And so, so in each area, there's no glare from the area, from the next area and the area before. Um, whereas if you try and light a, light a whole whole range, a whole area with a wide beam, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get some glare with it. So that's the way you can control the amount of glare that the um, the visitors might see, and it's really important to stop that glare. But equally tricky is glare to the people, to the celebrant, to, to the vicar or, or whoever it is who's carrying out whatever kind of service it is. Now, there's always a bit of a challenge here. Um, um, in this practice, we do quite we do quite a bit of theatre lighting and performance space lighting. And any professional actor will know that if you are well lit, then people will then the audience will look at you um, and you are seen. And we all know that the brightest thing in the field of vision is what the human eye goes to. Actors all know this. They all learn this in like day one of drama school. And so an actor will typically move towards the light um, and they know that if they are being glared, that means they are being lit and probably can be seen well. But unfortunately, um, your average celebrant doesn't go to drama school, <laughs> doesn't know those kind of rules, and they tend to be less um, appreciative of being glared. But of course, when they are, when they do have a bit of glare, that means they are being seen. So there's always a bit of to and fro with the design of the lighting of an altar because um, we want to make it look good so that the person conducting the service looks good and has light in their faces um, and doesn't have that awful um, panda eye look where because the lighting is so much down lighting you get a kind of black circles in your eye sockets um, and uh, but without glaring them too much so yeah it's very much a balance and there's two types of glare in places like this, so that's a good question. Um, thank you. Yeah, we've had a uh, so uh, Tim Leading has asked, uh, how did you find the experience of using the Bluetooth controls, and how did it compare in terms of commissioning and setup uh, versus a more traditional wired system? Um, it basically went well. I, I, I think. I think one of the reasons it went well um, was because we had done quite a lot of preparation um, and, and, you know, work, working with, with you, Chris, you know, a, a lot of work had been done on where the relays are going to go and, and making sure we could get um, signals to all the places we needed. Um, and interestingly, what, what surprised me was that the, the contractor took it really well and really got into the installation of a Bluetooth system um, you know, with, with a new system. And you've got to remember this, this project started in uh, 2017, I think, so um, a while ago. So it was all quite, you know, it was newer technology then. Um, and, and the contractor did take it on board and did, did understand it, um, which, which, was a, which was a good thing. I mean, yes, it has challenges. And yes, I think one needs to think carefully. Um, in each project as to what is the best solution. Um, but because we were so keen to keep the number of wires down, um, we did go for a wireless solution in, in this project. Um, I uh, hope that's kind of answered the question. I think so. Yes, Roberto, sir, has got a related question about how much flexibility you then give to the uh, operators, the, the client, in other words, to change lighting levels without sort of Throwing out the overall scheme uh, balance. Um, on, on this project, we gave a lot of flexibility to the client. The lighting is controlled by the number of locations where there are push buttons, which call up um, scenes, which 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 we put in 
some while ago. But the client also has a, uh, a, a pad or a laptop um, and they can get into the system and they like doing it. That's the great thing. And they can set up temporary scenes for special events, special performances, um, and they can fine tune things as well. And it's the kind of client who, who like doing that. And we're very happy for them to do it because in a space like this, um, they have a whole range of different performances. They often have you know, a concert in the east or in the west or in the north or the south um, and different types of, of, of performance. And there's no way that we could give them scenes for every single type of performance um, because no one knows what they're going to be um, at the beginning of the project. Um, and so, so when you have a, a client like this who actually enjoys the technology and understands it and can get good results out of it, let's give them you know the chance to actually use it and uh, and they do and they th they thoroughly enjoy that flexibility and being able to do that right, yeah so it's, it's an interesting observation i'd add there that um with a lot of uh, even quite small churches they often have at least someone who's really quite technically savvy for sort of audio visual systems and uh, performance lighting and that type of thing and um they're often quite good clients actually aren't they for uh, sort of engaging in that level of detail versus uh, perhaps somewhere like a museum where you know few of the staff would, would take um, much interest in the uh, under the bonnet of the lighting controls well uh, yeah and that's a very good point because that's that actually chris you hit the nail on the head there because um, the, the, the classic problem with the museums is if they are showing light sensitive artifacts is that is that is that the uh, the staff will, will will if they if they get, the, get given the chance can push the light levels up because they think it all looks a bit too dim um, um, because maybe somebody complained because it was a bit too dim but unfortunately there's no choice because in order to stop damaging those those light sensitive artifacts you unfortunately have to show them in dim light um, luckily uh, in in this project because there's so much daylight that the the, the, um, the levels gener generated by the artificial light are relatively quite small um, whereas there's there's no shutters on the <laughs> on the windows and so I mean like at this time of year daylight is pouring in from six in the morning until you know you know, late at night um, and so in terms of lux hours dosage um, any kind of uh, um, um, delicate um, objects uh, are are being well dosed by the natural light uh, and not by the artificial lighting. Uh, I've just uh, got time for probably a couple more uh, questions. Uh, one of them um, probably uh, I'm a better place to answer this one uh, from Manny about the uh, emergency lighting uh, philosophy. So that that, that was something that um, uh, CBG consultants, my firm, um, uh, took on and. Um, the simple answer is we, we with uh, very much with Mark's agreement, we just decided to keep the two systems entirely separate. Um, I think we, there was a nervousness about how a Bluetooth system might um, cope with uh, the um, existing main static inverter they have at the cathedral. Um, and so uh, a series of small, uh, discrete little uh, non-maintained spots were, were placed around those um, walkways uh, the clear story that mark uh, showed you the slide of early earlier on just sort of peeping over the side um enough to like the floor level we, we have to take a slightly nuanced view on some of the areas in terms of what light level we could provide um but, but again i think the interesting thing when the calculations versus what you actually saw on site um when we did the demonstration everyone was um, more than um, happy with it so um, yes, I think there's a good argument for, for keeping the two uh, separate for these these sorts of um, installations. Uh, I don't know if you've got any further comments on that, Mark, but um, certainly our uh, take on it. Uh, and I, I completely agree with that take. I think it was that was a good a good principle. Um, and and I mean you you don't notice those emergency lights when when you walk around, which is which is which is perfect. Um, uh, and so I mean. And they are there and they're providing the lighting necessary when when they need to which is exactly you know what is needed so that that was good i mean i mean uh, it was it was a one, great project sorry. as well okay, yeah. so, so, certainly was and um yeah so, so i mentioned again to um 
Purcell, the uh, architects, and uh, Monard, uh, the electrical contractors, um, and uh, Clifton, the main contractors, and, and several others involved. Um, but just a final one, Mark, if you're allowed to answer this one, but um, uh, Luc Ishana uh, Alanis has asked, could you give a rough number of the, uh, give a sort of approximation for the cost and the budget of the fitting, including the um, uh, luminaires and controls? Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'd, I'd rather not answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I mean, it, it's it, it's obviously a big and detailed scheme. So I mean, it, it, you know, it it, it it was not it, it was a major piece of work. It was a major piece of work which the cathedral quite rightly undertook. It was the right time to do it. Um, uh, and you know, as with so many places, uh, an old tungsten scheme had to be removed, um, and that, that meant a complete um, relighting of the whole place. And, and so that that was done. Yeah, yeah but you, you sort of touched on the fact that there was a major program of um, stone repairs too. And um, I, I think, if I recall correctly, that was kind of the original instigator for the project of the cathedral realizing they needed to make these. Um, repairs which in, in, involve putting up kind of enormous uh, expensive complex uh, access equipment um, and, and uh, then the thought being well if you're gonna do that you know it'd also be a good time to um, get the access and uh, replace to the lighting scheme or, or you know certainly there's a kind of um, uh, synergy there in a uh, economy of um, uh, scale I guess combining those two things because a lot of the cost in a, something like a cathedral it, the light fitting might be a hundred pounds but getting it into place and wiring it could could be um several thousand pounds as a standalone job with all the access you need so um it's very much about trying to uh, uh take that approach um, as for financial support i'm not aware that the um college got any on this project i mean they do sometimes get funded by things like the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, Mark, don't they? But um, I, I believe this was all just paid for by um, Christchurch. Yes, I think that's right, Chris. Yep. Uh, but uh, but uh, don't quote me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up there and I'll, uh, I'll just thank Mark again uh, for his time in um, preparing this and uh, talking to you this afternoon. Um, as mentioned at the start, the uh, the um, entire presentation will be recorded and available through the SLL's website. Um, those of you who've joined the event live uh, will get CPD certificates uh, emailed through to you. Uh, and the final thing to say is our next scheduled event coming up for the uh, SLL Home Counties Northwest uh, is going to be in November, a um, slightly different uh, one uh, an, an in-person event with the uh, chance to get some hands-on experience of um, different type of light fittings uh, outdoors after dark um, to create a uh, temporary lighting installation so uh, keep a lookout in uh, around about September or October for uh, formal uh, announcement on that um, and uh, otherwise that that's it from us so uh, thank you again for uh, all joining us thank you